everyone, good morning, and welcome to the Africa Policy Journal Fireside Chat. Um, good morning and or good afternoon, wherever you are, and a happy International Women's Day to everyone. My name is Adobe Ezokoli. I'm the Editor-in-Chief at the Africa Policy Journal. Um, the APJ is a student publication here at the Harvard Kennedy School, which focuses on elevating conversations around policy um, um, that affects the African continent. Today's fireside chat is brought to you in collaboration with the Harvard um, University Center for African Studies, and we are delighted to be partnering with them for, for this conversation. We are fortunate and delighted to have with us for today's conversation, the Right Honorable Dr. Saulus Klaus Chilima, Vice President of the Republic of Malawi. Thank you, sir, for graciously accepting our invitation and welcome to Harvard. The fireside chat will be moderated by our very own Professor Zoe Marks, public policy lecturer at the Harvard Kennedy School. Professor Marks, thank you for partnering with the APJ to elevate this important conversation. A few housekeeping rules before we proceed. Today's fireside chat is segmented into two sections, a moderated conversation between Professor Zoe Marks and the Honorable um, Vice President, and then a question and answer segment. If you have questions, kindly use the Q&A button to ask your questions. If you see a question that you would like to be asked, you can then use the up foot button to, um, to, to vote on it, and our curators will take a note of that. We are also streaming live on the APJ's Facebook page, so thank you if you're joining us from there. You're welcome to share insights from today's conversation on social media using the hashtag APJ Fireside Chat. Now, I would like to welcome Sirak Kurban, APJ's public publication and design editor and a master's student at the Harvard um, Graduate School of Education to introduce today's moderator. Hi, Sirak. Thank you, Ada, for that. Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon to others. Again, my name is Sirak Kirbin, the Publication and Design Editor at Harvard's African Policy Journal, and it is a joy to be here. Um, it's my honor to introduce our moderator. It's also a little bittersweet because her course, which is one of my favorites here at Harvard, um, Africa and Global Politics, is coming to an end tomorrow. Yes, our moderator will be Professor Zoe Marks, a lecturer in public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. Her research and teaching interests focus on the intersections of conflict and political violence, race, gender, and inequality, peace building, and African politics. Her current work examines the internal dynamics of rebellion in Sierra Leone. It draws on nearly a decade of fieldwork, several hundred interviews with former combatants and community members, and private archives from members of the Revolutionary United Front. Professor Marx is leading a separate project that examines how wartime experience shapes individual well being and community reintegration after war. Using surveys and social network analysis in Sierra Leone and the Democratic Republic of Congo, the project compares peaceful and protracted conflict settings, respectively, to explain how mobilization for violence affects prospects for poverty alleviation and peace. Prior to the, joining the Kennedy School, Professor Marx was a Chancellor's Fellow and tenured lecturer at the University of Edinburgh. She has previously worked for the UN and non-governmental organizations in Ethiopia, France, Sierra Leone, South Africa, the UK, and yes, the US. Thank you, Professor Marx, for being here. Thank you so much, Sirak, and welcome again, Professor Marx. I'd like to now welcome, um, I'd like to now invite Arian Morrison, the APJ's lead publication editor and the senior at Harvard College to introduce our esteemed guest, Arian. Thank you, Ada. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. It's truly my pleasure to be here and my honor to introduce our guest today, the Right Honorable Dr. Salos Klaus Chilima. Right Honorable Dr. Salos Klaus Chilima is a Malawian trained economist and thought leader who is serving as the fifth vice president of the Republic of Malawi. He also recently served as the Minister of Economic Planning, Development and Public Sector Reforms. He is currently spearheading public sector reforms in the country. He has served as the country's vice president since 2014. 
Before joining politics, Dr. Chalima held key leadership positions in various multinational companies, including Unilever, Southern Bottlers Limited, and Airtel Malawi Limited. At Airtel Malawi, Dr. Chalima rose to become the first Malawian managing director. During his debut as head of Airtel in Malawi, he brought with him a deep knowledge and popularization of the digital economy. Dr. Chalima possesses a wide set of multi-sectoral experiences, spanning from financial services, fast-moving consumer goods and services, and telecommunications. He has led strategic and breakthrough projects like Project Precision, Yabuka, Airtel Money, and a 3G network upgrade that resulted in significant impacts on industrialization. In 2016, Dr. Chalima also authored a report entitled Africa's Sustainable and Inclusive Development, Understanding the Capacity Challenges for the Africa Development Memoir of the African Capacity Building Foundation, a specialized agency of the African Union focused on capacity building. The Africa Development Memoir is a series that features prominent African leaders in political and technical fields of specialization. In this series, Dr. Chalima shared his memoirs, insights, and experiences on the role of information and communication technology. Apart from being a philanthropist, Dr. Chalima is driven by a strong inclination towards self-discipline and service to others. He is an accomplished motivational speaker whose style is grounded in pragmatic thought, focus on results, and people-centered leadership. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us today. Thank you so much, Arian, and thank you again, um, Right Honorable Dr. Chilima, for being with us today. If you're joining today's conversation, please drop us a note in the chat to tell us where you're, where you're, where you're logging in from um, so that we can have a sense of who is in the room. Professor Marx, I'd like to now turn this over to you for the moderated conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Ada. Thank you, Arian. Thank you, Sirak. And thank you to everyone who's put this incredible opportunity together for us this morning. Um, because we are pressed for time, we have a guest with a very busy schedule. Um, Honorable Dr. Chalima, I'm going to jump right in and thank you for your expertise and for sharing it with us today. We have a large community joining us online, and I know that we'll have a number of people who are joining us in the recording afterwards. So I want to Thank you for sharing some of your insights. Um, we have a, a broad conversation and as Ada has shared, we hope to get to questions as well. So Honorable Dr. Chalima, I'd like to start with the global challenge that all countries have been facing for the past two years, which is the COVID-19 pandemic. At Harvard, we're recognizing our two year anniversary of when we closed um, and sent students home for spring break, not to return again. And the president of Harvard has just announced a shift in our masking requirements so that after this year's spring break, which is next week, we will be seeing each other's smiles in person um, for the first time in quite a while. Like the United States, Malawi has struggled with the economic and health impacts of the pandemic. In particular, Malawi, like other Southern African countries has been uh, grappling with limited fiscal support and fragile health systems with uneven access to primary health care. The pandemic has plunged most of Africa into its first recession in over 25 years and vulnerable groups, including the poor, informal sector workers, women and youth seem to be suffering disproportionately from the impact on reduced opportunities and lack of access to social safety nets. Can you tell us a little bit about how the COVID-19 pandemic has played out in Malawi and what the priorities are of your government for thinking about economic recovery and health sector development in the year ahead? All right, thank you very much once again for having me. Uh, to start with, uh, happy International Women's Day and uh, I'm wishing you all the very best. Uh, first of all, let, let me say that um, we should look at it in two parts. Uh, first is um, to assess the actual impact uh, of the COVID-19 uh, you know, uh, in Malawi. And of course, then second will be the private sectors that, uh, you know, having been impacted, you identify to focus on uh, as part of the recovery process. So just like... Um, many other economies or countries, uh, they, you know, the shocks 
were in two parts, external shocks as well as uh, uh, internal or domestic. And the exogenous shocks would have uh, pretty much impacted on uh, exports and uh, remittances because uh, obviously markets uh, and borders were closed. Whereas uh, on the domestic front, uh, you know, the impact would have been felt uh, in terms of uh, a reduction in uh, uh, outputs as well as uh, uh, employment numbers. And uh, specifically to mention a few sectors, agriculture um, uh, being one of them, and then wholesale and uh, retail, manufacturing, construction, education, of course, health, transport, uh, tourism, just like many other economies, uh, and of course, aviation and sport. And, and of course, let's call it the whole hospitality and uh, entertainment uh, sector. But then, you know, the first uh, two waves uh, of the pandemic exposed capacity weaknesses uh, in our economy, especially in healthcare, uh, in uh, relation to uh, our ability to handle uh, large and increasing numbers of the pandemic, uh, limited human capacity, institutional and financial resources, and uh, obviously, this disrupted our health systems, uh, as well as, of course, uh, forcing us to respond uh, by making resources available at a time that uh, we should have been deploying these resources uh, for uh, supporting economic growth uh, interventions. And, uh, you know, that's pretty much, you can look at it as the downside to, to the pandemic. There is very good positives that we can report, uh, and we can report that later on. Uh, you know, in terms of uh, how uh, the country responded, uh, in, you know, constituting a presidential task force uh, that was, you know, to lead the response efforts uh, and provide regular updates uh, to the country so that people actually know what is going on. And if you're going to be reaching out to potential uh, partners to support with the efforts, uh, at least you have, uh, you know, the structure uh, in place and, and you know uh, which areas to direct your resources if anybody was uh, going to respond. And yes, indeed, a few partners responded. Now, <clears throat> the socioeconomic impact of the pandemic uh, revealed that uh, we're vulnerable as a country uh, in a number of uh, uh, areas. Number one, uh, you know, the healthcare system. Second is the education system. Uh, and third is the social protection system. Fourth, the labor market, and fifth and last is the macro uh, policy environment. And uh, we then came up with a recovery plan, which is specific uh, to COVID-19, which aims to build, uh, number one, a resilient and sustainable health system, uh, and second, a resilient uh, and sustainable education system, same with the social protection systems, as well as a resilient economy and the labor market, and finally, uh, you know, an enabling, predictable, and of course, stable uh, macroeconomic uh, environment. So, in responding to your first uh, intervention, uh, I would want to stop at that point. Uh, and obviously, when uh, we come back to the open session, uh, I'll be more than glad to provide additional uh, insights into any specific questions. So, I'll stop at that uh, in as far as the first intervention is concerned. Thank you, Honorable. Um, I'd like to go into a little bit more detail about some of the health system weaknesses, the vulnerabilities that you've experienced and identified as a result of the pandemic. We've seen innovative collaboration through, for instance, um, the Africa CDC, the COVAX initiative, and more recently, the African Vaccine Acquisition Trust, which aims to sort of address supply chain challenges and provide Malawi and other countries secure access to vaccines for on-time delivery. But many countries have faced challenges with um, vaccine uptake. There are questions about availability, timing, safety, efficacy. I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about some of those challenges in Malawi's current experience and how you're thinking about building internal vaccine production capabilities, either inside Malawi specifically or within the region if there are collaborative plans afoot. And also, what do you see as the role of the private sector and intergovernmental organizations like the African Union in securing increased domestic or regional production and distribution of vaccines and other therapeutic drugs, perhaps for COVID-19, but also for other um, diseases? 
Right. Uh, so again, I would want us to probably look at it from uh, <clears throat> two angles. First is um, the provision of the support system. Uh, what I mean by this is, uh, you know, vaccines in terms of making them available uh, and, and uh, making sure that the distribution network is fine. Uh, the people that means that them are there. Uh, all the logistics, everything is in place. That's the first part. And then the second part is in relation to the question you raised about <clears throat> the apathy uh, or uh, you know the rate at which uh, you know people have uh, responded positively to the whole uh, vaccine or vaccination campaign. So first will be that uh, you know just like uh, all other uh, economies, uh, we need to leverage. Uh, what is there already, uh, you know, the CDC, uh, you know, the rest of Liverpool's uh, Welcome Trust, the rest of North Carolina, the African Union affiliate institutions, and all those, uh, you know, to first of all, make sure that research is adequately done. Uh, second uh, is the actual, where we don't have to do any further research, and the research comes in uh, especially from the angle that uh, we all want to be producing our own vaccines locally. But in the short term, uh, because you have to respond to the pandemic uh, with speed, uh, then the collaboration with uh, other geographies, you mentioned uh, COVAX, uh, to tap into that facility and make sure that we can access as, you know, as many vaccines as we possibly can. And therefore, you know, to take uh, part two of that is to make sure that yes, the vaccines will come, uh, and then how do you make sure that they're in the right places for the uh, citizens to access? Uh, and then once all that is done, procurement, logistics, and then you can actually start administering, is to grow the numbers. Because right now, as we see, we're probably hovering around 10%, 11, 12 uh, at the most. The wish is to get to somewhere around 40, 45. Uh, one wishes we could do more. Uh, by the end of the year. <clears throat> and therefore, uh, with the myths and beliefs, and of course, there will always be that anti-vaccine campaign, uh, we need to put in place a very robust uh, communication strategy to demystify uh, what is uh, all the negatives that are being put out there for people to see, uh, be it on social media or indeed, uh, in uh, some of these uh, religious institutions, it could be uh, uh, traditional beliefs, etc. How do we surmount that challenge in order for us to achieve uh, herd immunity and make sure that uh, we protect lives, first our own lives, uh, and of course uh, lives of uh, the greater population uh, in this country. And because we also have neighbors to be responsible to, uh, because of the borders that we have, uh, whether you go through the uh, traditional legal uh, border systems or, or access control systems, or indeed, uh, just like people live in the rural parts of the countries, uh, they can walk across from one country to another without really having to worry about immigration formalities. So the point really is, um, as, as a country, we have tapped into COVAX. Yes, we have bemoaned uh, the discrimination around the whole vaccine uh, support system. I think that, uh, you know, the situation is a lot better now than it was uh, 12 months back. Uh, what remains is now for us to make sure that uh, we get as many citizens uh, vaccinated as soon as possible, and then we can avert uh, another crisis in the unlikely events that uh, we get uh, probably a fourth, fifth wave uh, of, uh, of the pandemic. So, you know, I would want to leave it there. And, and then, of course, you talked about private sector. Uh, and the private sector, in, in, in our case, uh, you know, it, it could feature in two, in two ways. Number one, the investment in uh, uh, manufacturing, uh, but also uh, as part of CSR uh, to, you know, complement the efforts, you know, the government is making, and of course, our donor partners are making in, in procuring and making uh, vaccines available, first to their own employees, and on the first second uh, in the communities where they, uh, they participate or where they uh, do business. So that's you know, where I would want to stop uh, in as far as uh, that point is concerned. 
Thank you very much, Honorable Vice President. So I'd like to pick up on the private sector conversation, and it's really thinking in a new direction around some of the ways that technology and sort of domestic or indigenization of um, technology is, is transforming everyday lives in Malawi and in other parts of Africa. So I'd like to ask you about the financial services industry, those who live in Malawi, other parts of the region, or who have been following closely developments in Africa know that fintech, financial technology startups, are all of the rage right now. They're finding ways to um, serve unbanked populations who have historically been sort of excluded from savings and credit. But this, as much as it's unlocking opportunities for people, is also leading to um, sort of a, a expansion of indebtedness that could be further impoverishing people who don't have the sort of financial education or access to financial safety nets to navigate this sort of proliferation of, of financial technology um, tools and also opportunities. And so many think of Kenya's M-Pesa when they think about mobile payment technologies. Zuna is very popular in Zambia, Mozambique, DRC, and Malawi. And so these are payment systems, but there's also these sort of new lines of credit and indebtedness that are opening up. What is your view on technology and entrepreneurship, not just in fintech, but more broadly in creating jobs and employment? And how do you assess some of the potential risks? How is the government trying to harness the technological and entrepreneurial opportunities that are being presented while also mitigating negative impacts? Right. So first of all, um, we, we look at technology or uh, you know, technological advancement as a, a counter uh, measure to the creation of jobs or employment. Uh, I think slightly different, uh, and, and I think to put it very directly, what, what we should be talking about when we talk, uh, you know, when we we discussing uh, technology is, uh, do we have the capability to train uh, the, you know, the, the employees to uh, understand new technologies so that then you know the technology becomes the enabler for new types of uh, jobs uh, instead of us um, uh, continuing to do jobs manually the technology should help us uh, to do things better and therefore the question of whether you know these you know technology will impact negatively maybe in some cases it does but i think broadly speaking uh, technology should be helping us create jobs, you know, create smarter uh, employees because they're able to understand technology uh, and produce more and uh, produce uh, better. In the case of uh, mobile payments, uh, locally we, you know, we have uh, Airtel Money, Bamba uh, and others, uh, you know, we think that uh, they have also helped us in creating uh, you know, SMEs as well as uh, jobs, uh, you know, for, for people that uh, uh, have, uh, you know, signed up to be uh, agents or uh, distributors for uh, these uh, mobile companies or indeed uh, financial services providers, uh, you know, be it in, in banking or uh, in telecom. But, uh, you know, why are we looking at uh, developing countries such as Malawi, uh, undertaking reforms in innovation and technology. We also need uh, to take cognizance of the fact that uh, uh, for as long as uh, our diffusion policies, i.e. dissemination policies for technology adoption, uh, remain weak and our technologies are insuff insufficiently adopted, uh, the potential contribution of technology to growth and employment will remain largely uh, untapped. And therefore our technology policies should have sufficient consideration of linkages with national innovation systems and the broader uh, structural uh, reform agenda. Uh, my own view uh, is that we should be, you know, investing uh, in, in uh, allowing technical change or technology uh, to, uh, to translate into more jobs, better jobs, smarter jobs as opposed to you know, the, the, the thinking that uh, the moment you take on technology, then the immediate impact is job losses. So that's my 
uh, understanding of, of technology and uh, job creation uh, in, in uh, very simple terms, I would say. Thank you. I'm glad that you brought it to jobs because I think there is this, as you said, sort of assumption that technology is necessarily going to be the fourth industrial revolution that supplants um, worker labor. And, and indeed, we've seen a lot of job opportunities emerge in the technological sector. So for the sake of time, I'm going to jump to my last question for you on the African continental free trade area, which is something that there's a lot of interest in here at the Kennedy School and across Harvard and, of course, across the continent. Um, but it rolled out at the start of the pandemic. And so I think there's sort of still an open question of what the AFCFTA, the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, will look like. Um, and I'm curious if you could tell us a little bit about your party's policies and platform and also the sort of broader Malawian government strategy to bring the private sector along in strengthening uh, job creation, as you said, but also this sort of technological in innovation, national innovation plans, and whether and how you see the African continental free trade area is accelerating and amplifying that work or is presenting new challenges. Right. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, let me say this, that uh, the government of Malawi, you know, recognizes and appreciates uh, the role of uh, private sector uh, inspiring uh, economic development and wealth creation um, through various innovations uh, and, and uh, through job creation, uh, as well as, uh, you know, in some cases to help us mobilize resources for uh, development works, uh, and, and this is really just to mention a few. Uh, and of course, there could be some uh, structural and uh, policy bottlenecks that the private sector uh, in any economy uh, will face, uh, and this might impact on, on them uh, uh, showing off uh, their full potential, realizing the full potential. Uh, for that reason, I think locally, we must appreciate the fact that the government uh, through the years uh, has made, you know, deliberate efforts uh, to engage the private sector to understand uh, issues that affect the private sector and, of course, then uh, intervene appropriately uh, where necessary. We have uh, two forums uh, that exist. One is at government level, uh, which is uh, a ministerial committee uh, that is intended to uh, listen in and, of course, uh, respond by putting in place uh, requisite policy uh, frameworks to support uh, private sector uh, wishes. And second, which is more um, quote-unquote operational, uh, is, is one that uh, involves the interaction between our Minister of Trade uh, directly with um, uh, the private sector. So it will be trade and industry and of course the private sector. So that helps uh, to keep that uh, uh, engagement uh, going. But uh, we have noted uh, that uh, there are some impediments or challenges that they face, you know, transportation costs, uh, issues of taxation, uh, connectivity, uh, that uh, becomes, uh, you know, uh, a very big uh, challenge, uh, energy, uh, as well as, in some cases, uh, water supply. Uh, and these all impact on the cost of doing business and competitiveness uh, in the economy. And therefore, uh, we have, uh, as a country, deliberately, uh, you know, paid attention to uh, issues to do with uh, energy, ICT, uh, infrastructure, uh, et cetera, to make sure that we create an environment that is enabling for uh, uh, the private sector here. Uh, and, and I think we must understand it in two parts. That first, uh, we need the existing private sector organizations uh, to thrive in this economy because those who become the first advocates to say that doing business in this economy uh, is good because they do have the following uh, policies. So we must allow for them to either you know, grow you know, horizontally or indeed uh, to integrate vertically uh, and make sure that their businesses are working. The second part, obviously, is when you uh, start looking at uh, attracting more and more FDI. But uh, for one to attract FDI, obviously, like I said uh, before, we, we need to make sure that um, uh, the ones that are here can speak good uh, about the environment. So if it were in, uh, you know, in a banking uh, sector or telecom sector, uh, we want to look at how we do, you know, in the one hand, customer retention, those that you have, you have already acquired, you must keep them, 
uh, and guard them jealously so that they don't leave you to go to the next uh, uh, door neighbor, uh, as well as uh, you know acquisition when you're trying to uh, attract new investment into the economy. So that there, I think there is absolute clarity in terms of what needs to be done for us to create an environment that is enabling. So policies, we can talk about taxation, we can talk about insurance, uh, so a bigger part, we can talk about whatever incentives, you can talk about security here uh, for the businesses, remitting their dividends, et cetera. Uh, I think in terms of the policies, uh, that's something that is there. If it must be tweaked uh, to suit a particular need, that's fine, it, it can be changed. But as we go forward, uh, for us, uh, the, the thinking and the wish uh, is, is really uh, to see an economy uh, that is uh, investing more uh, towards creation of uh, industry here so that we could be producing much more than we do. Uh, hoping that, you know, with production, two things could be achieved. Number one, um, we, we drive an, uh, you know, an import substitution agenda uh, that has got its own attendant gains. Uh, and second, of course, is to tap into the markets uh, and, and benefit from our ability to export uh, good quality products uh, made in Malawi uh, on the international market. And there is uh, a massive opportunity there within the region that we are, which is SADC. Uh, we can export there. Uh, the continental free trade area you talk about is massive. Uh, I think at Comesa a few months back, uh, the, you know, the, the meeting there or the summit there bemoaned the fact that there isn't that much you know, uh, intra, because we are in the, within one block, they, there isn't very much intra-regional trade. Uh, most of us, you know, find it easy to do business with Asia or with Europe or with the Americas, uh, whereas amongst ourselves, uh, the trading is uh, significantly uh, impacted and therefore uh, corrective measures uh, were suggested, you know, to try and start closing that gap so that between countries within that regional block, uh, you know, trade amongst ourselves is bumped up uh, and uh, we could benefit from uh, economies of scale. I mean, the population itself uh, is massive enough uh, to consume what is produced uh, within that uh, uh, trade block. So, um, <clears throat> with a population of 1.2 billion uh, people, and uh, I think the estimated GDP there was over a trillion dollars, uh, we think that uh, it remains for us as, as an economy uh, to set ourselves, uh, you know, in the position of readiness, A, to reduce on uh, importation, and B, uh, to benefit from that block and export a little bit more than we are doing. So that then, of course, uh, our current account numbers or the balance of payments numbers are looking healthier uh, than they do currently. So let me uh, pause there, uh, and uh, we, can, uh, we can look at uh, uh, specifics uh, when the other questions come. Thank you. Thank you, very Honorable Dr. Chilima. I will pass it back to Ada. We have about 10 minutes left and I think we have a poem. Thank you so much, Professor Marx, and thank you so much, Right Honorable um, Vice President. It's been such an engaging conversation. Um, I feel kind of bad to have to cut it off, um, but I am looking forward to the Q&A session. We'll pivot to Q&A, but just before we do that, I'd like to invite um, Maureen Luba to perform a short spoken word piece um, in honor of today's conversation and in honor of um, the country of Malawi. Maureen. Thank you so much, Ada. Maureen, you want to make vice president. Uh, this morning, I know afternoon there, I'm going to share a short piece uh, by one of our own uh, poets from Malawi, Linley Mainda, titled Moriwanji, which talks about uh, our beautiful country, Malawi. Uh, Drifting Valley which mountains and lakes were formed, beautifying the skies and the horizons, twinkling of the stars, that makes water smile and shows its time on teeth. Floating mountains, where clouds dance at the living of the wind, birds singing for the rising of the sun, fresh breeze greets every soul. Muribwanji, humanity is our breath. Lord us of our men, Babao, whispers of women in admiration of their men, folk tales being told by our goggles, or how great it is to be part of this home, the warm heart of Africa. 
Zikola and Dindiri, Zikola and Transangara, Zikomo. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maureen, um, for that beautiful piece. I'd like to now invite um, Noah Asfal, our um, the APHA's lead interview editor, to handle the question and answer segment. Noah. Thank you. Thank you, Ada. Um, and thank you, uh, Vice President, the Honorable Vice President, uh, Dr. Solis uh, Chilima and Professor. It was an interesting conversation to listen to uh, two of you discuss. We have a lot of questions from our uh, participants. I'll try to be quick and go through uh, some of the key questions. Um, so I think the first question from our guest is, from our participant is uh, in relation to technology and data protection. Uh, the first question is, uh, having observed more young people are using technology products and new media, are there any plans to introduce ICT classes uh, from as early as primary school? And uh, Are there any policies put in place uh, to reduce the access uh, between youth and rural and urban Malawi to reduce uh, the gap in terms of access to technology? This is our first question. Right, if you want us to go one for one. Um, uh, fine, thank you very much for that question. Um, yes, and the answer is yes. The uh, curriculum is uh, being uh, reviewed to respond uh, to uh, the evolution. Uh, nobody will be left behind with uh, technology. And therefore, from primary school to secondary school or high school, in other, in other words, uh, and of course, universities are non negotiable. Uh, that is being revised, that where we didn't provide for it becomes an issue. And second, um, beyond just uh, revising the curricula, is making sure that you provide the resources. So you need computers and stuff. Uh, as well as the second point now to that question, which is access. Uh, how do we make sure that uh, we improve access to internet? Um, there is two parts to this. The Malawi government, of course, on their own, uh, driving um, a lot of um, uh, projects to make sure that we reach as many uh, rural places as possible. So, you know, for instance, the fiber backbone running across the country, and then we have to take it into the districts and the farms, and then you create the metros in there uh, to make sure that uh, you can take it into homes, into offices, uh, and whatever it is that people do. Second, uh, with the World Bank, a World Bank funded project uh, through our BPPC, the Private Public uh, Partnership Commission, uh, I think it's a $75 million project uh, to look at uh, creation of hotspots in a number of institutions, hospitals, uh, bus terminals, you know, restaurants, and uh, of course, uh, education institutions uh, of higher learning. So, in short, uh, we would like to respond to that in the affirmative that yes, for the youth. Uh, we will respond accordingly. And finally, in terms of access, uh, it is in our interest to make sure that we have as many people uh, accessing internet as possible for two reasons. A, they must access it. Number, number two is for us to create critical mass and with it then uh, comes the pricing of both data as well as the voice products. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vice President. That was an interesting uh, response. Uh, uh, we have a question in technology in relation to data, but we, we will come back to that if you have time. Uh, there is another question, uh, which is a pressing issue. Uh, climate change has been uh, a major discussion point globally also at the continent level. And Malawi has experienced extreme uh, climate-related events such as droughts and flood. Uh, what would be the government's immediate policy direction in the face of the escalating climate change, especially considering the recent event of the cyclone Anna on uh, Malawi? Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. I, I, I want us to approach that from uh, two uh, dimensions. The first one being the prevention, uh, and then the second is the response. Uh, and, and I think we shouldn't uh, mix the two uh, and, and not to insult the people that are asking the question. But I would want to say that in as far as responding uh, to uh, disasters of different 
uh, magnitude is concerned, the planning uh, is in place, the structure is in place uh, from its, its bottom up, from the community level all the way up to central government. Uh, there is uh, a structure of how we should respond, who we should be reaching out to, and then they also know uh, who to contact, etc. So in as far as uh, planning for our responses concerned, that is there. The challenge becomes uh, when you are hit with uh, a very big magnitude uh, disaster, then obviously you'll be uh, you know, under pressure for resources, be it financial, human, or indeed material. So that's on the response side. Uh, policy documentation uh, with our Department of Disaster Management uh, is, is, is there and, and available, and, and uh, I wouldn't uh, fault the policy and planning side of things. Perhaps the response of it uh, could be better, but that is also dependent on uh, our ability to access resources. So probably we needed to start looking at providing a little bit more, but again, nobody uh, prepares for disasters. Uh, it means that you still have to have a, by the way, in the event or in the unlikely event that we have a disaster, we are going to press this button in as far as our finances are concerned. The first part, and therefore, becomes the prevention, which is looking at how, okay, we have destroyed uh, nature uh, for different reasons. Uh, how do we then make sure that we correct the situation? Uh, through the Ministry of uh, Forestry and Natural Resources, uh, there is a plan uh, to make sure that we, having understood uh, why uh, people uh, cut down trees, etc. Uh, there is a plan to also begin to retrace uh, the forests and the mountains that have been denuded uh, to make sure that while people are going to need uh, fire for cooking because they must eat, uh, we shouldn't continue on the onslaught. Uh, we are killing uh, natural habitats for wildlife and then they're coming closer and closer to people, risk of diseases and so on and so forth. So I, I really think that um, uh, from the prepared side, we, we, we are okay policy-wise, we could do more. Uh, on the response side, uh, in terms of planning and which buttons need, people need to press, we also know. Uh, we probably just need to go a notch higher in terms of allocating a little bit more in terms of financial resources, be it locally generated or indeed reaching out uh, to funds that are available out there. Uh, to begin to address uh, climate change uh, effects uh, more aggressively. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President. Uh, in the interest of time, we have one uh, more question. Uh, the question is, uh, how is the government trying to balance the trade-off between stimulating the economy by, example, reducing the interest payments and financing fiscal deficit vis-a-vis -vis the investment required to stimulate the economy and uh, growth. Come again on the first part, to balance between? Uh, basically, the question is, what is the government trade-off uh, in terms of prioritizing uh, on, the, uh, on uh, addressing the response to the pandemic and as well as stimulating the economy by uh, increasing investment? Uh, activities. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, interesting. I don't know whether I can say that in one minute or two. But um, let, let me say it in this way that uh, first is uh, in terms of clarity of where we should be going with the economy, I think that is settled. Um, the plan to 2063, the plan to 2030. And obviously, we have this uh, social economic recovery plan, uh, which must respond uh, to you know, the, the COVID impact, making sure that you know, we don't get backwards uh, much more. So we're creating a resilient systems, health, education, social protection, uh, an economy that is, uh, you know, the policy is more predictable uh, and, and uh, we probably achieve stability and then, of course, sustainability in the long term. Thank you. In terms Thank of, uh, in ter in terms of jump-starting uh, the economy itself, and, uh, one of the things that uh, we have identified as an opportunity to, to, to create activity in this economy, of course, is infrastructure development. Uh, it's one of the key enablers for the attainment of our vision 
uh, that takes us to 2063, that we must have economic uh, infrastructure, and, and this is, you know, infrastructure that is solid. Now, if you pump in money into that sector, uh, the ripple effect is there for all of us to see with the creation of jobs, uh, the creation of uh, small businesses. I mean, if, if, you, if you're going to be building a road that extends 300 kilometers, there surely is going to be activity across the span of that uh, 300 kilometer stretch. Um, and, and the thinking, therefore, is that as you create uh, more and more jobs, you know, three years uh, is probably long enough a period for a road to be finished. But then it mustn't just be that after the three years that people become jobless, but because you must still continue that development. That's in the, you know, that is activity in that one sector. There could be uh, activities in other sectors uh, where we will deliberately invest uh, so that we jumpstart economic activity. So like I say, uh, I mean, obviously one thing, because this is agrarian economy, uh, what are we doing in the agriculture sector uh, in order for us to boost uh, activity there. Uh, so we can talk about anchor farms or mega farms, depending on which you know, school of thought you're coming from. Uh, you can look at uh, irrigation uh, and its attendant gains, etc. So the, the, the thinking in terms of uh, where we must go and where we must inject resources first, I think that is settled. Uh, what we're trying to do now uh, as a collective is to access uh, such financing so that then we could put it into these sectors and then people can actually see uh, that the activity has started happening. Uh, the proof of the pudding is in the eating until uh, people see that the money has gone into a particular sector. Uh, for now, it becomes, you know, a matter of uh, doubt and, and, and people will still be skeptical whether uh, the planning has happened well or not. But I can assure you that uh, uh, I just mentioned those two sectors, you know, infrastructure development and, of course, the agriculture sector, that there is interventions already planned. All that remains for us to do uh, is uh, inject some uh, uh, finances and, and boom, uh, there will be activity uh, in this economy. Thank you, Vice President. Now I will pass it on to Ada for our closing. Thank you so much, Noah. Um, right Honourable. Dr. Saulus Chiliman, Vice President of the Republic of Malawi. It's been an honor and a privilege to have you join us for today's um, Africa Policy Journal Fireside Chat. Thank you for sharing your perspectives and insights into some incredibly pressing issues um, on the African continent and um, in your country of Malawi. Professor Zoe Marks, thank you so much for taking the time to moderate today's conversation. To everyone who joined, we're really grateful to have you here and we look forward to you joining us in future chats. Um, I'd like to again thank the Harvard University Center for African Studies for their partnership. Um, thank the student services, um, Professor Nancy Gibbs, um, for their support for all the work that we do. And I'd like to thank the APJ team for continuing to work to ensure that we elevate policy conversations here at the Harvard Kennedy School. My name is Adobe Ezekuli. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Africa Policy Journal. It's been a pleasure to have you join us today, and we've come to the end of today's webinar. Do have a lovely day. Thank you. Thank you very much.